Good afternoon. Um, so I'm the moderator for this session, and I wasn't really prepared either, but it's just been a fascinating day of discussion. Um, so much is going on in my head. <laughs> um, I guess I, I think it's been really nice to hear um, from uh, Bruce in particular about an example of how you can have a clinical program set up to kind of mirror what's going on in terms of just that diagnostic evaluation and maybe even that afterward follow-up. Um, so I was just wondering, Bruce, maybe I can ask you and then we'll open it up to everyone else, but I, I'll start with a question. Um, you mentioned it would be valuable to have access to the core facilities, the model organism, metabolomics. Um, are there other aspects of the network that you would want to be able to connect to um, to enhance what you have at UAB? I, I don't think I can think of an aspect of the network we wouldn't want to be able to connect okay. to if we could, um, not, not even knowing what all the moving parts honestly are. You know, the, obviously we don't solve every case and we'd love to get a, into a situation where we could share our unsolved cases with others and perhaps learn from them. So that would be obviously one thing and all the various functional studies because, you know, we, like everybody else, often come to kind of dead ends where we, we see something that we think might be meaningful but it's pretty difficult to take it to the next step to establish for sure that that's the case. So does anyone want to, I'll just open it up to the questions are here listed. Um, the first, what are the end goals? Um, what about the idea of broadening the objectives that already exist for the UDN and including that mechanistic understanding and, and, and ideally leading to treatment? Um, maybe how are, you, how are you thinking about that or are there other objectives that should be added to the list or are, should there be any that should be taken away? Yes. Well, I think, um, now I have to admit a bias in this, but once we're sequencing the genomes of all newborns um, and querying that information, you know, once uh, symptoms start or if there's uh, conditions that are actionable, we'll start treatment, you know, pre-symptomatically, but, you know, we'll have far fewer undiagnosed diseases, you know, that have a genetic basis at least. Um, but beyond that, I think, you know, speaking as a clinician, um, and partly, you know, given what Bruce has demonstrated with being able to do one of these at his own institution, that it, you know, it may take some money, but it doesn't take huge amounts of resources to do this. And, you know, as a clinician, some of our limitations are certainly the lack of insurance coverage for doing uh, exome or genome sequencing and as well as, you know, some of the more specific areas of expertise. So I think, you know, trying to develop a broader network where you continue to have, you know, larger centers of excellence, but, um, you know, to utilize all of us that are doing this every day, you know, look, trying to figure out diagnoses in patients. Um, and, you know, if we had more resources in terms of, you know, a place where we could send a sample for genome sequencing, um, I think that would be, you know, extremely valuable and, and increase the amount of, um, you know, patients that could filter in then for some of these other uh, components, you know, whether it's the basic science research or looking at, um, uh, you know, model organisms and, and what have you. Yes. I guess I would, first I would echo what Steve said during his presentation about the concern of, of the mission creep and focus on the idea of what can the UDN uniquely do. It was designed to come up and figure out ways to diagnose undiagnosed conditions. And uh, you know, we've been working for several years, and I think we're all still trying to figure out what's the best way to do that. So I think the next cycle should be improvement on how we do that, what we're already trying to do, at least with the primary focus, and then thinking about how to, to give the, the long-term viability of it, um, whereas bringing in a lot of other things to it, I think we would another, need another 10 years to figure out how to keep those viable, I think. So, 
from my perspective at least, it, it seems like focusing on what the charge was initially and thinking about how can we more broadly create what they did, for instance, in Alabama, and, and how there's other models for places. So then you're really exporting the, the methodology of the UDN, making it more general, um, but not trying to take on all these other roles which are valid and important, but really beyond the scope. So the UDN right now has an infrastructure. There is a, a manual of operations, as I understand, I haven't read the manual of operations, um, but I'm assuming it has a set of core functions, processes, activities. Um, but I also understand that the clinical sites have developed their own implementation strategies around those core functions. And so maybe what needs to be studied are the implementation strategies, even understanding why one site has opted to do X and another Y to solve the same core function or process, as you say, so that um, we can understand, you know, what works given one set of resources um, and what works when you don't have that around uh, so that people could have a package or a toolkit to select from based on what their local needs and resources are. Um, it sounds like I'm involved in health services and implementation research, and it kind of sounds like that's where you were going. Yes, Judy. Uh, um, it's, it seems to me that most of what has happened have been single gene disorders. So there are a couple of people with two gene disorders because they're consanguineous. But what's the plan for moving toward multifactorial disorders? I mean, are, are, is anybody looking at modifiers uh, for severity? Is, is there any way to think forwardly about, I mean, maybe it's really old fashioned to think that there is multifactorial disease, but I, I kind of think there probably is. So is, is there any one of the groups that are doing additional modifying factors within the genome? So I think that that raises an incredibly important point that um, there's really two activities of the UDP that maybe could be separated from one another. One is making a diagnosis if a definitive diagnosis can be made, right? You know, there's enough information in the world, so if you find the right clues, you have the right knowledge, you can make a diagnosis confidently and return that to the, the participating family. The other activity is taking everybody else, which is the majority of our patients, as far as in our, pro in our hands anyway, and moving the story of those families forward, either by determining new mechanisms or by sharing data so that you can so that you can generate cohorts. And so I think the second of those two things is really more in the category of what the UDN can do uniquely. And falling into that category are going to be things like disease causation mechanisms that we're not at the point yet where any combination of acute, I'm sorry, um, astute uh, clinical experience and existing testing is going to prove to the point where you could tell a patient they could test a pregnancy with it. So, so for instance, it, it seems to me that the whole business of some drugs have bad effects in some people, and you wouldn't be taking those drugs unless you had another disease, cancer drugs, for instance. And at least our cancer agency is now testing everybody before they give the drugs to see if they would have a horrible reaction. And there's some component of that, the interaction between the genetic disease you have and the potential therapies, it seems like it should have some potential. Can I ask, does that get back to the argument of maybe not having a large enough population to work with to dissect this stuff out? Not I mean, necessarily. Okay. I mean, that's how in worms and flies and yeast, people have worked out all the pathways. Mm -hmm. Uh, they start with single genes and look for suppressors or enhancers, and so this is essentially the same thing. So once you have a database where you have all the mutants, and that's what they're already doing in yeast, is making double and triple and quadruple combinations and seeing how dominant alleles can interact with each other. And so it's a matter of funding the basic research 
that promotes the understanding so that when you find your gene and it's in a pathway, you know what other genes to look for. I completely agree with that, but I'd say it's a slightly different question if you say, like, should the network be set up to do to try to find them in patients? And I think it's, you're, I think there it's, you're right. This is the scale is not even close to correct here that you could hope to find a second site suppressor or whatever in, a, in the patient population. You've got to do it in a model organism and then go back and see if it's relevant in some patients. And if two candidates would be identified in a patient and you can test them both in a model organism, you can just look for them, right? But I think it highlights the need for a lexicon that allows you to move efficiently from patient to model, model to patient. I think the fundamental problem is, you know, thick heart or big liver doesn't translate in worm and fly in the way that we would like. So we need to have much more granular clinical phenotypes to be able to make any sense of most of what we do in medicine. There is a yes and there is a no. The yes is you're right, but there is also a no. Well, you know, flies, biologists discovered the notch pathway, and, and if you find a wing that's notched, you think hard invertebrates because you know that the notch pathway is involved in hard. So, you know, you can translate these things pretty easily if your knowledge is there. And in fact, there is databases now to categorize all the phenologs and all the phenologic phenotypes so that you can translate quickly from one to the other. No, I, I completely agree. I just think it's, that's a ver fairly modest subset of the total pathway space. That's all I'm saying, yeah. Are there, are there other things that the UDN can uniquely do? Yes. So I was, um, knowing I was coming, I was racking my brain for weird, wonderful new kinds of diseases. And it seemed to me that organelle wear out might be one of them. Um, or organelle mismatch. In other words, within my genome, I can make endoplasmic reticulum, but I like wear it out fast or something like that. And what I'm wondering is, with the biopsies that are being done or with cell material, is anybody kind of thinking on an organelle level? That requires transmission electron microscopy and systematic uh, TEM, and that would be very useful. It's our main diagnostic tool. So that brings up the issue of what's on the horizon. I mean, are there going to be new diagnostic, like clinical diagnostics, like ultrasound is going to become even cooler, and there are going to be new DNA diagnostics, I think. So is there any subgroup that's out there looking for the potential application of new stuff? Yeah, this is a, it's a huge industry at the moment, is, is new diagnostics. But I think to, to get back to your point, and this is one of the reasons, for example, our, our site has chosen to really go sequence first, is if you have something that's in an ER pathway, you're going to go and take a biopsy specifically to collect an additional sample for transmission electron microscopy because you're going to actually want to look at that in the organs of interest. So I think, I mean, it, it gets to the fact that root, you're just having a stand, I suppose the real question is what's the definition of deep phenotyping? You know, one person's deep phenotyping is the next person's superficial quick look over. That's the fundamental problem with all of clinical medicine. And until we have some fundamental uh, ground truth, it's very, very tough to move forward because it just depends on who you happen to see first. That's the, the whole of clinical medicine is completely based on who did I find first. Many of these diagnostic odysseys would never have occurred if they'd, ha if they'd happened to see the right clinician on the first day. Yes. I think one of the other potential deliverables is around, uh, Callum and I were talking about this um, uh, before lunch, which is, you know, when we think about evidence-based medicine right now, we've got, you know, the medical students thinking about um, randomized control clinical trials. Um, and that's not going to happen in the space. And so I think one of the challenges is, is that 
animal models are bad. There was that uh, editorial a few years ago about how mice have done more to hurt uh, drug therapy than anything else. These are ba the barriers we're fighting against. And so I think part of what can be adopted in this is how are the physicians who are using the information making decisions, and why are they willing to use a zebrafish or a mouse or, or a fly to help them in the outcome? Because I think in absence of that, as we've talked about earlier, what we're going to have is an amazing pipeline, amazing data, and no one's going to use that. So I think that's another place that the clinical sites could maybe be helping on is why are they using that information? And when it's published, is there a way to capture that as to why that choice was, was valid? Obviously, having 100 other cases is ideal, um, but what do you do with one or three or six? I, I would argue that the, uh, those of us who do both, both uh, basic research and clinical research, that's a very relevant question that most of us be interested in, but most clinicians are not. Um, and so that's not going to be a relevant deliverable for them. Um, I think more important for them is how do I figure out which patients need to be getting into this type of network infrastructure sooner uh, so they're not wasting a lot of time. And then two is, you know, what is it we're going to provide back to them that's useful uh, to them if we're going to hand the patients off? Not a simple question, but, but I just think that that's a reality. So, so that's the reality that scares me, okay? So there's 20 million undiagnosed Americans. Uh, if we all started working 24-7, there's not enough knowledge base to be able to do that. If we can't translate this out to our medical colleagues, it's a failure. I mean, we're helping a handful of patients, but we've got to really think about how to get this out to the masses or we can't get there. So you're speaking about, again, kind of implementation outcomes, what the six sites are currently doing, how they're getting there, what's working, what isn't working to get to a, a specific outcome so that we can develop a package that could be exported out. Is that? Um, maybe. I mean, it's more of, a, it's, it's a logic series, right? What data will you use to make a clinical decision and what will you use for that information? So is that What data do you animal? need? Yeah, that's the question. Right. right. So, so right now the answer is, it depends on the physician. Right, so that would be the argument to have more standardized for, for the UDN right now, perhaps, over the next five years, to have very standardized approaches to how patients get in, what happens to them once they get in, and some kind of follow-up. Maybe what's currently being done is satisfactory, but and everybody doesn't have to do it the same way, but just using instruments, data collection, so that we can look at these and, and evaluate the processes. Is that? I think well, sorry. I don't have a better Tell idea. Me. I think hard. You mentioned it earlier. I think it may have been Bruce or, or maybe it was David who mentioned it. A, a learning system is what you actually need, and so that mm -hmm. requires you to have essentially some shared minimal data set, some sense. And those minimal data sets could be things. I mean, I think Bill has advocated very strongly, and I believe it's very important. Those data sets could be, you know, the number of specialists that you've seen before and what those specialists are. That information may actually be the best predictor of whether coming through a network like this has any chance of efficacy whatsoever. But right. just having some set of data at the very front end, including, I believe, some limited phenotypic data. I think if there was some uh, standard phenotypic matrix that everybody had to fill out and that, you know, included just a general exam from, a, from the clinician that's referring them, I think that would actually be a useful start. Phil. I'd like to make just a few points. Our protocol allows us to do medically indicated invasive studies and fibroblast biopsy, but it doesn't allow us essentially to get a biopsy specific to a variant that we found on um, exome or genome sequencing. So for example, we couldn't do a liver biopsy just because we found a liver specific variant and go, go after that, not by our protocol now. We could change that, I suppose. I, I was imagining we would take it next, if we're going to take a biopsy, we'd take an extra one for EM or whatever, if we knew what we were looking for at a cellular level. Fair, fair enough. But, but it needs to be medically indicated to do the, the invasive procedure to begin with. But I, I like the idea of having an EM core. I think that would be spectacular. It's so difficult and so expensive for us to get electron microscopy. We don't have, you know, decent electron microscopy at the NIH that I know of. I hope no one's listening. But, 
Uh, and the other possible core that I've been thinking about a little bit is a stable isotope core for metabolic studies. Uh, in the very special cases in which we need to find out how the whole organism um, manages a particular defect that we find. And boy, if you had that, that would revolutionize, I think, uh, some elements of clinical research the way the CTSAs don't. Any thoughts on um, outcomes from the UDN and uh, best strategy to optimize the outcomes? And I think that relates to, well, maybe, maybe not, the next question about the sustainability. I think I heard earlier today that in order to be sustainable, we need to somehow demonstrate value of the process. Um, Thoughts on that? Yes. I just wondered, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I wondered if we could ask Kevin to, to, to say a little bit more about your partnership with the CTSA at UAB. I mean, is that, it, you, you said that you're, you, you guys function on $200,000 a year, but you are also functioning within the context of the CTSA, so can you help us understand I think that's what I understood you to say. Yeah. How does that work? Um, so it's it's not money that they're providing us. Um, it's I guess um, networking to investigators on campus. Um, so they have their um, sort of tentacles out to pretty much well not about all, but a very high number of um, clinical and basic science investigators. So we we use them some to um, help disseminate things and attract other people that we can, or help even identify people that we can engage to take a finding to the next level. They also have a um, set of partners, the way they're, they're set up is there are um, partners in the um, surrounding states, so Louisiana <coughs> and um, Mississippi, and we partner closely with Hudson Alpha actually as well. And um, so that all happens in the context of of the CCTS, that was how we were brought together with them. So we're trying, I don't think this has moved as far as I'd like, but we're trying to open up the opportunity for patients to be evaluated um, with some of these partners in Mississippi and in Louisiana particularly. Oh. So. Um, I hear the potential because of an example like Bruce's um, of being able to develop a strategy wherein you could create additional centers that could learn how to leverage some of these resources if they had access to some of the core functions that you're building that are so critical to, to discovery. Um, it's really hard for one of us when we get what looks like a really causative um, gene to come back and say, well, we're pretty sure that's what it is. And we don't have any way to go and find the experts who can help us with that, unless you're much more enterprising as an individual than most of us have time to be. So one of the things beyond the expertise that you're developing in how you approach these problems is building a, a, a strategy by which others might be able to access some of that information and, and broaden it a little bit. It makes it a little bit more for the common man, but that just increases your reach, if at all possible. So um, not that I think all of us and I are going to run back and try and set up our own little mini UDNs, because we can't. But if we knew that there was someone we could call and say, you know, I have this great patient and has this great gene, but I don't know how to prove what it is, you might be able to extend the reach just a little bit further, because you'll have that much further down the road in terms of the discovery. Yes. I fully agree, uh, but the resources are pretty limiting already. And in fact, I get calls from physicians almost weekly who want to jump in and are not part of the UDN. And I can't cope with the numbers of the UDN, so uh, I invest three times almost the amount of money I get from the UDN for this project. And that's because I'm a Howard Hughes investigator. I can do that, but it, it's impossible. It's just 
It's easy to do, but it's labor intensive, and you got to be able to deliver. And you're speaking about the core, the core support. Yes, John. To ask a question, um, Bruce, I calculate that UAB is putting in $2,000 a patient, 100 patients a year, for, so that's $2,000 a patient. I actually hadn't calculated it that way, but I suppose you do the arithmetic, that may be right. So that's part one. And then part two is that Scripps, an independent standing research institution like Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, also launched it for demonstration processes, and they must have felt that it was good for science. Um, Dr. Prescott, could you comment on that? Uh, well, it's important to know, is it Scripps Clinic or Scripps Research? No, I think it's Scripps Research. Am I correct, Scripps Research? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with it. Oh, no, Topol uh, is, is in, on the medical side, on the clinical side. So it might be a business development scheme by Scripps. But, uh, well, certainly we do functional genomics on things, but you know, in collaboration, ours are all in the cancer space currently. I mean, you know, there are half a million unique mutations described in, totally in cancer patients without, without known functional significance, or maybe known, maybe unknown. So there's a huge burden in all types of diseases that's, that's there now. And so it's not unique to, to this set of patients that there's this backlog of, of uh, information that needs to be accumulated. But in cancer research, many of the drugs have been developed because people understand the basic pathways that are leading to the cause. Here, we don't have that. And so that should be a deliverable that after, during the UDN, functional genomics, systematic functional genomics should be part, at least for those key diseases where you can't interest the rest of the community to do basic functional annotations, and so you can start thinking about deliverables on a drug. Basically. That was my argument earlier. That's actually one of the, was one of the aims of our proposal was to use pathways so that short of actually getting a mechanistic uh, gene variant, you could at least identify which pathways were perturbed. Well, again, at the risk of being redundant, I, I think it's uh, crucial. I mean, there's still lots of good ideas, but it also strikes me that particularly given the example in Birmingham and the comment earlier that when everybody's sequenced at birth, uh, you, one could imagine that this is, this is going to devolve into different pathways. Undiagnosed diseases are going to go away because they're going to be diagnosed, uh, or that this set of patients is going to go away. Okay, probably not. Uh, but maybe largely, and that, I mean, that could be, you could declare a success then, right? Uh, this is, this works, you know, that, uh, and secondly, it's going to devolve to being run as a clinical enterprise at different places all around the country. So maybe part of the strategy should be to try to engage CMMS or somebody who has the, it's their responsibility to try to create funding mechanism for the clinical care of patients. And, you know, maybe it could be defined something like end-stage renal disease where there's a mechanism to pay for it, uh, the $2,000 a patient or whatever it's going to be. But it seems to me that if it's going to be a continuing effort at NIH, there has to be an unequivocal research component to it. Uh, not, and it's, you know, once it's the model of how to diagnose it has been established, that's no longer a research project in my opinion. That's established now. Uh, or, you know, maybe there'll be some some refinement of that ultimately, but you're going to have to go someplace else. And I think it's this functional genomics mechanism, ultimately therapeutics potentially. So, so, so do we understand that clinical model for that diagnostic pathway so that we can have that pipeline to get you to where you would like to be with figuring out the mechanistic pathophysiology? I mean, I guess that's where some of the clinical people around the table are, are wondering if we haven't really quite figured that out yet or that we can't that getting reimbursed for providing those types of services has been challenging, and that's why the UDP was established in the first place. So we're kind of this vicious cycle. Um, so I guess I would propose, I don't know if anyone else would agree, that one of the maybe aims over the next five years is to really figure out those, you know, diagnostic pathways, what's most efficient, as we heard the uh, previous speaker comment on, and then try and get some measures of outcomes that maybe relate to quality of life or real health outcomes, avoiding treatments that were incorrect because of a misdiagnosis, um, just trying to quantify all that with a program like this so it could be, you know, you could sell it to, 
a university or a CMS. Yes, Cindy. I'm recalling a presentation that we had at one of our recent North Carolina medical genetics meetings from a physician at Wake Forest University who started a um, complex disorders you know, uh, clinic um, that was initially funded by the parents of a child who died after being on a diagnostic odyssey and you know, not figuring out what the underlying problem was until they were deceased. Um, but she brought together, you know, a group of experts who just meet on a regular basis. They don't have a genomics core or anything. They can't get exome sequencing. But just, you know, having the experts talk to each other, um, they were able to, you know, show benefit in, in making diagnoses. And actually now their, their hospital is, is paying for that service because they were able to show, you know, a cost savings to the healthcare system. Yes. Um, at Duke, we have a parallel undiagnosed clinic that's funded by the dean, and we have the UDN, so I can offer a direct comparison between the two. We also get some funding just like you do at UAB. We get a genetic counselor that's funded. The dean subsidizes some of the sequencing if you're not able to get insurance coverage for the sequencing. So what's been the challenge there compared to the UDN is the time it takes. Uh, so to get four clinical consultations for a patient can take up to two to three months sometimes because we don't have a focused one-week consultation that can happen. We've not been as successful as you have been in having buy-in from all of these clinicians. Some people will say, oh, my clinic's full this month, can accommodate. They don't do that with the UDN. We get a lot more buy-in. The second challenge is, of course, insurance coverage. Any of us who sees patients know that that's a problem. And the third is, on a shoestring budget, the genetic counselor is stretched to her limit just to coordinate things for the family, to bring them back in or to, you know, you need this appointment, you need to go here, so that kind of thing. So if you're talking about sustainability of the UDN, I loved Rizwan's idea of having, you know, centers of excellence maybe mm -hmm. going forward, but perhaps these kinds of challenges should be taken into account when we are talking about how we can make this sustainable. Maybe there's got to be some institutional commitment and some funds elsewhere that in combination will let this work go forward with a reasonable amount of, you know, less money but a reasonable amount of out outcomes that are sustained for the patient. The other challenge, of course, we also face is what I think one of Susan said. We don't have any ways of pursuing candidate genes other than reaching out to individual investigators and begging, and I think that's been, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Yeah. So maybe, as I think also Roswin was saying, right, like having a white paper around best practices, um, you know, if the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics would maybe have a, their face on that as a professional society of, you know, how best to approach a patient with an undiagnosed disease that might go to a certain extent, you know, far enough to convince a healthcare system or maybe a payer. It's better than where we're, we are right now. Eric? No, I mean, I, I have, I totally agree. I've, I've had similar experiences with um, uh, my more limited field of reproductive disor disorders of reproductive development and when there is a consensus statement or guidelines or best practices and I'm not talking about standard of cares but insurances and hospital systems do buy in if it says in the consensus statement that there should be a mental health professional at clinics with patients with a DSD hospital systems actually is like eh, okay yeah we don't want to be liable not to do it so there, there is more it, it puts pressure on hospitals administrators but also on, on, on insurance companies so I, I however imperfect those guidelines may be I think it would be it, it, it certainly would be a, a good outcome of the of the UDN yes so um, so pick up uh, picking up on that thought that people said earlier one hybrid model could be what UAB is doing and so looking to eight years down the road maybe if uh, maybe the program could be configured as in a way that the cores are supported by NIH, yeah. but individual centers are um, take part in it based on their institutional commitment. 
Um, uh, so because the idea, you know, if you look t 10 years down the road or eight years down the road, maybe there's a different way to look at model organism, but we will still need model organism. So the idea there would be that we have the, in a, in a fantasy world, I guess, that we have actually uh, a, a model organism core. We actually have a sequencing core. We have a metabol metabolomic core or another core that we deem necessary. But the centers are uh, applied to NIH to get the designation based on their own funding. And of course, they'll be working at a limited level, but something to think about, I think. And that might foster some of the collaborative efforts that we heard today, um, even, you know, and in particular even with patients and families. And I can see a lot of that being part of a center of clinical excellence around this. So one, when we just have a couple minutes left in this session, uh, is the vision, mission for the UDN different for the future than what it has been? Can I ask a question about when do you think you'll be able to diagnose 80 or 90 percent of the patients that <laughs> are, I, I have no good feeling about the number. I never think it will happen in five years. So oh. maybe 15 or 20 and even then. And so if the UDN has an eight year kind of lifespan, we're going to be maybe halfway. If we've grown 4% in, in three years, then it, it's going to take a long time before we get there. So I think there are two things. I think there are the undiagnosed diseases, which I think like our patients, let's say with rare Noonan's phenotype, and then there are unknown diseases, where we have a rare variant that has never been associated with disease. So I think uh, while we may be diagnosing a lot of undiagnosed disease, we will be nowhere close to 10 percent in diagnosing unknown disease. And I think the other element is that there are lots of diseases at the moment that are undiagnosed and unknown that are lumped together with things that look like they're known. And we lump them together just simply because we have a generic treatment that vaguely works for each of them. So diabetes, coronary disease, heart failure. So I didn't get a precise answer yet. Though. Well, I, what I'm saying is it's, an, it's enormous. It's, I think you're 100% right, Hugo. I think it's a, it'll be a long time before we sort it all out. So why does, so why does the UDN need to end in five, five years or eight years or whatever it is? If, if, if it's clear that this is not going to you know, be ended by then. I guess the issue is not so much that it may end, but what, how might it transform you know, to continue with funded sites as they are now, um, and or I think one of the suggestions was to maybe have these clinical centers of excellence that could do much of that diagnostic evaluation component, and then with the support of the course funded by NIH. I think that's what I heard as an option. All right. So anyway, um, thanks for. Uh, David pulled up the objectives, the, the current objectives, just to remind everyone. Um, and I, one of our questions for this session was, should this change, I think? Is this still the right target? Thoughts? So, you know, I, I think the point I was trying to make before is that maybe it goes under number one, but one thing I believe the program can do is to help establish the paradigm of, of how these things are approached. And I, ter I actually prefer the term evolve to devolve, by the way, but um, in any case, I think we can evolve to a situation where there are many programs around the country that are following the lead and implementing this into day-to-day -day care, while the cutting edge part of it can remain in a kind of hybrid research clinical environment. I guess the other thing, which maybe it got covered early this morning when I wasn't here, and I, I suspect everybody deals with this, but for everybody with an undiagnosed disease, there's probably five that are sure they have an undiagnosed disease. And how you actually sort out the wheat from the chaff is, a, I think, an important question. Okay. 
So, uh, so I don't think we have to change these goals because we don't have enough experience. We barely started six months ago. So I think, as uh, somebody had earlier mentioned, I think our goal should be going forward in the next five years of the funding cycle is to actually refine these goals and really figure out where we, you know, uh, where we are. But I don't think we have enough data to actually now think about changing these because, like you said, every site says site has looked at a very limited number of patients. And, and, I, and I agree with that. But these are corporate goals. None of these things up here tells you about the individual patient that's in the room with you when you're examining her. <clears throat> and I, I think we shouldn't keep our, we shouldn't uh, forget about those individual patients in the one-on-one -on -one and taking care of that person. Because all of these things are systematic. How can we do better as a, as a group, as a nation, as a program? But we have to take care of the individual first and not let all these other things get in the way of that. But I think creating a model that can be um, um, put out through the rest of the country so it can reach more um, individuals is a goal that we could aspire to. That would. Is that kind of under item three? Or is that a separate? Yeah, I think I would just add um, clinical. To, so create clinical. an integrated and collaborative clinical and research community. OK. And these are the shortened versions of the objectives so that they fit on a slide, not all of the language that's actually in the FOAs for each of these. This is like the summarized version. So the idea of this being clinical and research is in the full version. I, I would just follow up, I guess, on Christine's comment and, and uh, Anastasia's comment. I guess the idea of talking about integrated, collaborative, clinical, basic research, whatever, there is, I don't really see that the charges optimal management, it seems like that's what occurs after you figure out pathophysiology and you're thinking for, for some point that that's not really our focus, but. I'm wondering if the and care in item one could kind of encompass the optimal management, but John's telling me we're out of time, so uh, thank you all. <laughs> Okay, so thank you everyone. We've made it through our six questions at this point in time. We will have another 15 minute break for folks to uh, come back here at 3.15. At that point in time, we will have our panelist discussions. We're going to run through all five of our speakers in a row and then have a little bit of time for some more discussion before we move on to talking about prioritizing what we've been discussing today. I have heard that a number of folks have flights that they need to be able to catch leaving around 5 p.m. or so. So we are going to try and get some of these discussions, bringing together the prioritization discussion with the draft recommendations and condensing those together to try and get done by 5 if we possibly can. So if everyone can make sure they're back here at 315, then we can try and get out of here a little bit early for people to make their flights. Thanks.